the start of a 72-hour strike in England. Of course I'm sorry, but the blame must lie at the feet of government. It must do. There is no reason we couldn't sit down back in October when we started our trade dispute. Well, the government's accused the union of walking away from talks. Train drivers have agreed to continue strike action for the next six months in their long-running pay dispute. Aslev says the results of its re-ballot shows members are in it for the long haul. The US Federal Bank has held interest rates after 10 consecutive rises. The decision came a day after official figures showed the country's inflation was 4%, less than half the UK's current level of 8.7%. Here's the head of the Federal Reserve, Jerome Powell, who hasn't ruled out further rate rises, though. Today we decided to leave our policy interest rate unchanged. Looking ahead, nearly all committee participants view it as likely that some further rate increases will be appropriate this year to bring inflation down to 2% over time. Well, new information about inflation in the UK will be released next Wednesday. A woman accused of posing as a man has been found guilty of sexually assaulting a short-sighted teenage girl by kissing. 21-year-old Georgia Billum from Cheshire was cleared of 16 other sex offences following three hours of deliberations. She'll be sentenced in July. Vodafone and the company behind Three have agreed a merger. They're promising investment in the hope they'll get the backing of politicians and competition authorities. In the city, the FTSE 100 has closed up seven points at 76.02. The pound buys $1.26 and €1.16. LBC weather, any showers passing to leave a dry night. Low cloud for parts of northeast England and a low of eight degrees. From Global's newsroom for LBC, I'm Daryl Jackson. This is LBC from Global, leading Britain's conversation. This is Cross Question. A very good evening for just joining us. I'm Ali Mirage. Uh, this is LBC and you're listening to and watching Cross Question. I'm joined by a very, very strong panel this evening. To my left, uh, I have Wendy Morton, uh, the Conservative MP and a former Chief Whip. I have Liam O'Dell, the uh, journalist and disability rights a campaigner. On my right, I have Emma Sinclair, the entrepreneur and also the chief executive of Enterprise Alumni. And on my far right, although again, probably not politically, <laughs> I, have, I said this every night, uh, I have Ronnie Cohen, uh, the SNP MP for Inverclyde as well. Now, you, lots to discuss tonight. You might want to uh, think about the junior doctor strike that's just started 72 hours. They want a 35% pay increase. You might want to talk about the asylum backlog where the Home Secretary Suella Braverman has admitted that the government might not meet its targets on reducing that backlog. You might want to talk about West Streeting, the Shadow Health uh, Secretary, talking about the fact that it's patriotic for rich people to pay tax or the obesity clinics being opened to deal with kids who are overweight. All of these things or anything else on your mind Feel free to call in 03456060973 or text 84850 or ask Alexa to send a comment to LBC. And don't forget, you can watch us live on Global Player. Call 03456060973. Tweet at LBC. Text 84850. Cross question. Watch on Global Player. This is LBC. So let's go to our uh, first uh, question, uh, which is from Richard in Fulham. A very good evening, Richard. Good evening. What would you like to ask? Well, I would like to understand what the members of your panel consider the reason why they feel that Boris Johnson has suddenly decided at this point in time to attack Bernard Jenkin with might of okay, give history. A... Sure. Let me give a little bit of context. Thank you very much for the question, uh, Richard. Uh, Boris Johnson uh, this evening called for Conservative MP Sir Bernard Jenkin to resign from the Privileges Committee after the website Guido Fawkes claimed uh, that Sir Bernard had attended a lockdown drinks party in December 2020. The Privileges Committee's damning report into Boris Johnson is due to be published tomorrow. Uh, you know that. It's going to come out tomorrow morning. Sir Bernard also happens to be a former chair of Vote Leave. Well, I've got to come to the former chief whip on this one, Wendy. 
I think, look, first of all, what I would say is that the main report is, is out tomorrow, so we will have to wait and see. Mm. The um, the suggestions, the occult allegations that we've we've heard about, about um, another lockdown party, I simply don't know. Um, and I might be the former chief whip, but I, I don't, wouldn't know it, wouldn't know, wouldn't know everything you can't expect me to. So I think that really is a matter between, uh, between Boris and between, and between Bernard. Um, and I, I, I just think think that you know let's wait and see what where we get to with the with the report tomorrow and go and and move forward from 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 there i think it's also really important that i think you know i feel as parliamentarian to not lose sight of the things that my constituents are talking about and the challenges that they're facing in you know in all in all of this as we try to work our way through what is undoubtedly <clears throat> uh, quite um, an interesting time in in politics at the moment what, 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 when did you do you think um i mean obviously you were in charge of discipline Plain or I know it's a difficult job within the Conservative Party these days. Um, but do you do you not feel that this has all become a completely unedifying spectacle for the public to witness? I think, look, as Chief Whip, it is difficult. One of your, or can be, one of your jobs is discipline. Things have changed even a lot since when I was Chief Whip towards the end of the end of, the end of last year. But, but however you look at it, there is a there is a committee that was set up uh, to look at this particular issue. It's only right and proper that they do that work, and then the report comes out, and then it can be it can be judged. So obviously, I'm not going to preempt that. But at the same time, I do think um, it's incumbent upon us all as, as MPs. Certainly, I feel it's important to remember who put me in, who elected me into Parliament. That said, you know, my inbox is not, I might regret saying this, Ali, <laughs> but my, my inbox is, is not full of emails about, about this. It's people who, who are raising raising other issues. And everybody has a view on, 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 on Boris. I mean, my personal view is that, you know, let's not detract. He may not have done everything right, but he had a charisma. He delivered us a massive majority in 2019. And we did get that vaccine rolled out during the, the COVID pandemic. Well, when do you if your inbox is not full enough, I'm going to send you an email later tonight. Thank you very much for that. <laughs> uh, Ronnie. Yeah. <laughs> well, Why is he attacking Bernard Johnson? Alex, well, Alexander Boris de Fefo Johnston seems to have been abdicating himself of any of his own responsibilities his entire life. He's never really understood that he's also bound by conventions and he's bound by a network of uh, uh, behavioural patterns that we all obey in life so as society can actually function. Boris has got his own rules for Boris and when he's caught out, he lashes out at everybody and anybody around him. Sir Bernard Jenkins is the latest of a long list of people who's blamed. He's blamed uh, well, everybody, I think, that uh, hasn't stood by him all the time. He doesn't like criticism, he doesn't accept any criticism, he doesn't accept he's done anything wrong, therefore he takes no responsibility for it. And Bernard uh, seems to be the latest. But, Ronnie, let me ask you this. Um, Boris Johnson claims that uh, this is effectively a shambles, it's a stitch-up, uh, there's a conspiracy against Brexit, but also he points out that Harriet Harman had given public pronouncements before this committee even met, uh, implicating his <clears throat> guilt. And now if Bernard Jenkin, and I don't know the, the, the details yet, we'll have to wait and see, if it does turn out that Bernard Jenkin did attend a party and broke lockdown rules, and I, I don't know, I, 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 we have to wait and see what happens, would Boris Johnson not be rightly feeling a little bit bruised? Well, I think his argument is watered down by the fact that, as you say, he's already blamed Harriet Harman for this. So it's not Harriet's fault, now it's going to be Bernard's fault, or Bernard's up wrong. He's just as culpable. Everybody's as much as blame as Boris is, which sort of lessens his culpability in the public eye. That's what he's trying to do here. But it's, you do have... He's, a, also, trying, he's the, also trying to change the narrative over yeah. his report, which has been delayed because Boris has thrown in a last-minute uh, legal uh, complaint. So we won't get a report, maybe tomorrow morning. The contents of that report are what we should be talking about, not what Boris Johnson has, has, has created. But, but don't the people involved, and again, you know, <clears throat> we have to wait and see what happens with the Bernard Jenkins thing, so I'm just being cautious about that. But if it does turn out that there has been, uh, let's say, some inconsistency in terms of how um, certain members of the committee have behaved in terms of their own conduct, would that not actually then cast an aspersion over the whole entire work of that particular committee? I think you have to decide to what degree it is influenced. So we've all got opinions, even if we sit there and say nothing about it. Anybody that was going to chair that particular committee or mm. any committee is always going to have their own opinion before they see any evidence. 
but people have to be professional enough mm. in that situation to take it on board and say, this is what I've heard. We do it in Slick, but it's all the time. We produce reports and all sorts of, of uh, uh, things. I'm, I'm, I'm in pack I, we look at the cabinet office, we look at the civil service, mm. we look at how these things work. And I've got my preconceptions there. But yeah. sitting there listening to people giving you evidence, you have to clear your mind of that and say, well, what have the experts told me? And how do I then form my opinions around it? But, Harry Harman may have, may have said something, but I'm quite sure she's professional enough to chair a committee, which, has, mm-hmm. I think I'm right in saying, has got a majority it does, of it does. on it. That's true. Emma? Look, I'm an <coughs> entrepreneur. I tend to be forward-looking. I tend to say, uh, let's spend our time on the things that really matter. It's uh, nearly quarter past eight, <laughs> and we spent 15 minutes talking <laughs> about this when we don't know what the outcome is, with the greatest of respect, and we've all said the same thing. Do we want to bring everyone down one by one by one, and one person potentially tonight, another person tomorrow? I'm like, the country is at a really important inflection point. We have an economy to worry about. We have jobs to worry about. All those things in your inbox until two minutes ago, whereupon, uh, obviously, your <laughs> inbox is going to be flooded with everything else. So... M- my view tends to be that I'll certainly be reading the news tomorrow. Um, I really like to focus on the things that matter, generally speaking. Emma, I, I, I understand your point, and I think it's a very valid one. However, probity does matter in public life, doesn't it? And it also matters where you hear the victims outside the COVID inquiry saying that they had adhered by the rules, they hadn't been able to go to the funerals or visit their loved ones in hospitals or whatever it, the case may be. We remember the Queen as well, uh, sitting alone at that funeral. So if, if a government is passing laws that the rest of us have to live by, then you have to be totally above board yourself, don't you? Sure, whether it's parliamentary, whether it is running Isn't a business, it? whatever else it is. So not for one moment am I suggesting, well, to hell with it, people have behaved badly and mm. let's just get on with it. <clears throat> but also, it's just it's just become sort of like a, this incredibly toxic, elongated narrative before decisions are made, trial in the public. And my point is, yes, this is very important. Uh, a lot of people, as far as I understand it, broke COVID lockdown rules. Um, lots of people we do know about, lots of people we don't know about. Let's get the clarity and certainly people have to hold themselves up and be responsible. I'm I'm just suggesting that there are so many things, and to your point, Wendy, inboxes are full of things that really, really are important. And on the list of things that Mm. are important, perhaps there are other things that are more important that we should be fixing. Liam? Yeah, um, obviously, as as everyone else has said, uh, we we don't know the circumstances surrounding Sir Bernard and and the, the matter relating to him. But what I can say about Boris choosing to, to do that is it's... This is yet another instance of a former prime minister who cannot accept failure, who cannot accept when his actions have caused hurt, upset, um, whatsoever. And I I know we don't want to preempt the report from the Privileges Committee, but we know from the the reaction that he's continuing to give now that it is utterly damning of of him. Um, I think it's laughable that he's calling this a a witch hunt. The only witch hunt I see in the Tory party is Jeremy Hunt, um, the Chancellor of the Exchequer. Um, But um, this is a man who has decided to resign rather than face the electorate. And he could have he could have gone through the whole journey of this. He could have had the report be published from the Privileges Committee, had MPs decide whether this was a whole sham that he's like he says it was. Um, It could then obviously again go to the recall petition, which Mm -hmm. now has to meet a certain amount of of threshold. And then obviously there is there would be the by election as a result of that. I think I think ultimately, yeah, this is just a distraction, as everyone else is saying, from the major issues. I'm more excited for my constituency of Midbeds having a by-election where hopefully we can no longer see it as a safe you're going to have a, You're going to have an important role to play very soon as an elector in Midbeds. Absolutely. But, but, but Nadine Doris hasn't stood down yet. Well, so yes, we, we may be waiting down. a while. Just before we move on, I just want to come back to you, Wendy, on this, mm. because Emma made the point about serious issues out there to solve. And this is a point that Keir Starmer made at Prime Minister's Questions today to the Prime Minister Rishi Sunak about the fact that we've been talking about uh, a resignation honours list for the last few days um, from, a, from, a, from a former Prime Minister who's actually left, some would say, in disgrace. Um, do you think that that actually puts the Tory party in a good light? 
But I think when it comes to the resignation honours list, it's a long-standing tradition. I was at PMQs today, so I was listening the to and for, uh, to and froing. But I think it's a long-standing tradition that a, a, stand, a prime minister who stands down does have an have an on, 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 an honours list. So um, I don't particularly take issue issue with that. I think the issue has been how long it's taken to get to this point, mm-hmm. um, and the toing and froing that we seem to read about in the newspaper. I don't know all the detail of 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 that, um, but I think it's important that we. You know, we, we we move on. We've got two two by elections ahead of us. Uh, we need to get on and 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 fight those by elections, and then continue to do the work of government. You know, Prime Minister's got his um, his five priorities that he's set out. Mm-hmm. As all of us have, as local MPs, we'll have our local priorities that we are we are campaigning on. You know, so I'll be going back to my okay. constituency to to campaign on those. Okay. Well, uh, you heard it there. We're back to the constituency to campaign. Two by elections. Potentially three coming up uh, if uh, Nadine Doris uh, decides when she's He's going to actually stand, <laughs> <laughs> to stand yes. down. Indeed, um, <laughs> indeed, and Liam's going to have a role uh, in that uh, casting his vote. Uh, you're listening to Cross Question on LBC. If you want to get your uh, question into our panel, you can do that by calling 0345 973. You can text on 84850. You can ask Alexa who's always very, very decent and responsive on these matters, to send a comment to LBC followed by your question. You're listening to Cross Question on LBC. It's 8.17. This is LBC. Ali Mirage on LBC. Call 0345 6060 973. It's Ali Mirage on LBC. This is Cross Question. It's 819. I'm joined by my panel this evening of Wendy Morton, the Conservative MP and former Chief Whip, uh, also by uh, Liam O'Dell, the journalist and disability rights campaigner, Emma Sinclair, the entrepreneur, and uh, also by Ronnie Cowan from the SNP. Uh, let's go to our next question from Charles in Hull. Good evening, Charles. Oh, hello, Ali. Hello, panel. Um, business leaders signed a petition to the government um, that they wish for VAT to be lowered. As a Labour supporter, should this government or the next lower VAT to boost productivity in the UK? Emma Sinclair. Um, I am unashamedly in favour of almost anything that boosts productivity, and in particular right now, whilst businesses are having a really hard time, off the back of a war, off the back of COVID, off the back of a recession. So, broadly speaking, if we're giving short answers on this, 
um, I'm, I'm really in favour of anything that boosts productivity. But, 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 but Emma, you know, on the productivity point, and yes. it comes down to which taxes do you cut and when the appropriate time is, if you look at the argument that was made for lower t- corporation tax, 19% under George Osborne's gone up to 25 now, one of the arguments was that it would boost productivity. It hasn't boosted it at all. Well, I suppose it depends on the definition of productivity. Mm. Mm. Um, the question also becomes, you know, does that incentivise people to build more? If you think about corporation tax versus VAT, that's quite different for me. You know, does lowering corporation tax or capital gains tax or whatever else it might be mm. boost productivity? Well, I think people who are motivated to create and generate, mm. um, the more that you can incentivise those people, the more jobs that get created, the more... So I am broadly, I take a point, but I'm broadly in favour of things that boost productivity. Does VAT boost productivity? Not necessarily, but does it help generate... Does it help generate and boost business? Yes, I think so. Especially, you know, I can understand cigarettes and petrol and a couple of other things, but broadly, I'm afraid I'm... Yeah, all the fun things. Yeah, <laughs> not sorry, that, Not that I speak, not that I speak. Uh, Audrey, uh, Ronnie Cohn. Yeah, it's, it's, uh, I agree with what Emma's saying there. How, I'm not sure how a cut in VAT would actually boost productivity. If you can prove that it does, then crack on, absolutely. But tax has to be raised, unfortunately. We all pay tax. Hang on, this is breaking news. Sorry, it's sorry, a sorry. Question, it's a question sorry. of how we spend that tax. Am I, am I just, did I hear that right? That an yes. SNP MP is saying that we should cut VAT? I didn't say that. No? If, if you can prove that it, if pr- if you can prove that it boosts productivity. I thought I might have misheard that. I'm going to Google how, immediately how and see do if you I can pr- find How the do you prove it? Because it comes well, back to my point. point. So it was a, it was a, yeah. respect, it was a, it was a sort of double barrel question there. Yeah. Uh, all tax has to be raised, has to be spent wisely. If we want to boost productivity in companies, we have to look at investing in companies, particularly so incubation companies, where you've got small companies, mm-hmm. where you get rather than investing in the big companies. And let's make sure the big companies pay the right tax they should be paying. Let's take the right money off of the major companies and invest that in small growths. If you plant the seeds today so as these entrepreneurs can find their, their future maybe 10, 15 years down the road. But but all taxes should be raised. We should invest in small businesses. But I'm, all no, taxes I'm saying the, the taxes which are raised currently would be well advised to invest into small companies to help them grow. You're saying that way, yeah, okay. I understand your point, but you don't sound convinced that that which is currently 20%, it has been 20% since 2011, is actually going to move the dial on productivity from your perspective. Liam? Well, I I think, obviously, any any tax system needs to be fair. Mm. And I think if we're talking about productivity, which is the one thing that I, I would probably pick up on on this, is that if we if we want to look about if we want to talk about improving productivity, one of the biggest and strongest arguments I'm seeing at the moment to help with that is a four day working week. Oof. The the campaign for that has uh, the the campaign for that has shown that productivity has improved, well being has improved, that all of the all of the pilots that are, that are going on businesses are, are, are citing benefits and growth, which is you know one of the buzzwords of, of many politicians. There was shopping, take a breath. Yes, yes. <laughs> there was, and I've only just recovered. Um, <laughs> a few things. Uh, different shapes and sizes for different people of shapes and sizes, for sure. So perhaps, I, uh, you know, and I, I have a founder community. Now, I've got a business that is, is scaled globally, but lots of businesses I invest in and angel invest in, uh, smaller, earlier, are thinking about four-day weeks. I mean, you have uh, a lot to do in a week. You have countries that work on different time zones. Um, you know, I... Uh, I don't know that the, we've been looking at that really hard, but broadly speaking, um, to boost productivity, do I think we need to go down to four days a week? Not necessarily, I'm afraid. Well, Liam, you want to come back? I, I, I would. I, I mean, I would just kind of repeat the point that it's, this we're still in the, in the pilot phase of this, of course, yeah. and the, the campaign is, is is still going strong. But I think, I think ultimately, we have to think about. A variety of different factors that influence productivity and well-being is is one of them. I mean, we saw the recent bank holidays in uh, in May uh, in last month. A um, lot of people praising the, the the relief that comes with that. I think terrible it's... for small businesses though. That, that, you know, that, if you think about British small businesses, I have loads of friends that run businesses, and we're all glad to have a day off. Although mm. entrepreneurs didn't, but we understand how that's lovely. But for example, a small British business that suffers in so many ways then had to pay people and have less days to do more work. I've got to be honest there were people that i know who run very fair reasonable yeah. businesses who were like that is too many days off well no one's mentioned can be on a case-by-case basis wendy wendy yeah. just come back on the vet point first yeah i think well first of all i think i think we do need to continue to seek ways to boost productivity in the in this is case. lowering that the absolutely answer? i'm not convinced i'm i am pro tax cutting but i'm not convinced on the vat front front i mean i would like to see us do something on corporation tax i think Increase um 
No, um, I think reduce it. Um, I do think that uh, small businesses. Look, I come from a background in in, in small in small yep. business, yep. Um, but I do think small businesses take many risks. They work really long long hours. We need to find ways of incentivizing them and make people feel that if I work that bit harder, there is some reward for it. And I think in terms of productivity, using more technology is one way of doing it. But I don't. I'm not convinced at all about a four day working week because I really worry about how some businesses will actually cope. And, you know, if you're a business that is a seven day a week customer facing business, how do you then work that four day week model model into that? So I think it needs a, sorry, Liam, but I think from my perspective, it needs a lot more, a lot more thought. Wendy, uh, I mean, you obviously ran an electronics uh, company that mm. was providing uh, goods to the agri business. Mm. So you've, got, you've got a lot of experience in this area and you talk about tax. So you're not talking about lowering VAT but you've mentioned um, corporation tax and you also supported Liz Truss. With hindsight, do you still think that it was the right thing to do to talk about a corporation tax cut when we've got 2.4 trillion of public debt and 400 billion of borrowing on the back of COVID? I do, look, yeah, I do come from a background in, 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 in small business. We set our business up with £40 a week enterprise allowance, which might not seem a lot, but it, it felt like the government mm. was supporting us in some way mm. so i still i still believe that we should be looking at ways to support business to support entrepreneurs and i do believe that cutting corporation taxes is one of those ways that we that if we're not going to do it now we certainly need to keep it on the radar liam you're not convinced at all um no i, I think i think when we it, it's kind of just about the the system of, of fairness in my view so i, I think when we t when we look at vat a lot of uh, when that who that hits the most is people that are kind of going about um because it affects everyone it affects yeah. everyone yes yeah. but uh um but we, you know we, we're talking about a fair tax system and i think with co corporation tax um so I, I to answer the question yes i would say um look vat should be lowered okay. i think also but then to make it to, to make up for that shortfall corporation tax increase. Okay, well, at least you're being responsible. You should go to government. You're giving us both sides of where the money's going to come from. Yeah, sorry, you're running on. Can I just say, I think it was certainly mileage in the conversation. I mean, I ran my own small business for... Yes, of course, you did too. IT, yeah, absolutely. But I worked four days a week. Did you? Started at five o'clock on a Monday morning. Because you're running a computing business, weren't I started you? at five o'clock on a Monday years. morning and I worked until... Maybe nine o'clock, ten o'clock on Thursday was night. Was that a four day week? Which, yeah. yeah, well, that's, that's was, the point. We, we must have been getting it wrong because we were often doing seven days a week. Yeah. 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 Well, that's the point I was coming to. I limited myself to those four days, but put that I was in during those four yes. days so as I could have Friday, Saturday, and Sunday with my kids. I don't think Liam is talking about that. Uh, I don't uh, think he's I, got I, the idea of. Uh, that's, 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 that's why I'm saying yeah. there's mileage in the conversation. I wanted to have three days a week with my kids without work. Yes. And that's why I, I managed to model my work life around that. Right. I'm not saying everybody has to cushion all those into four days, but I think there's ways. In which it can be managed and ways in which it would That's be an interesting to concept. for business. Emma, let me just ask you, because no one's mentioned the dreaded B word. I mean, we, we, we haven't... We, it's it's 8.28, we haven't got to the the, the B word yet. You're but about yet, to. Yesterday, <laughs> yesterday, George Parker from the FT was uh, was here and he was talking about the effect that Brexit has had on his own brother's business. Uh, he runs a small business. You speak to entrepreneurs. You're an entrepreneur yourself. I am. Um, what are you hearing out there on that point? Um, I'm afraid, I don't know whether everyone's going to like this. Um, it, so in my world, a lot of people have built businesses that are scaling and scaled. Most of us don't come from money. We start <sighs> things from scratch and we've got some scale. We hire and, and, and employ quite a lot of people and a lot of us are global. I mean, there's a lot of people that aren't happy and there are a lot of people that are. I will say the thing that most people are doing is recognising that it is what it is and therefore we have to navigate the system as it is today. So you're being pragmatic so about it. They're pragmatic. And that would reflect the circle that I inhabit and engage with typically. And of course, I speak to lots of other people that have different type of opinions. There are things that are prohibitive and challenging uh, on one side of the fence and other things that might engage other people about why it makes sense. But um, entrepreneurs are typically, or the entrepreneurs that I know are typically pragmatic people who find ways to navigate around problems and challenges. Um, it does not mean, for example, that some of the really small businesses I know have not really uh, had challenges from um, tax regulation, paperwork, uh, logistics, stock and supplies. I'm not suggesting that lots of businesses have not had an absolute nightmare, but it is what it is and it's not going to change tomorrow. So let's find a way to work around the problem with be my general take. It is what it is, Wendy. Quick, no, I quick think comment Emma, from you. I'm going to get hate Emma, texts Emma, for saying no, that. Emma is absolutely spot on, and I think that is the business <clears throat> approach, a pragmatic approach. I take a pragmatic approach, whether you were leave, whether you remain. We have done Brexit. We, we 
the UK, it's about making it work the best we can. Mm -hmm. I get mixed picture from businesses. For some, it has not impacted on them whatsoever. And for some, they have gone out there and they have found the opportunities. But yes, for some others, there are challenges that they are still working through. But it's about identifying those challenges. It's not a lack of sympathy, of, right? It's yeah. not a lack of sympathy for people that are stuck. Quick comment, Ronnie. Yeah, just politicians made a complete mess of Brexit, and even in terms of the negotiations. Well, even Nigel Farage would say that. And then, and then what <laughs> we've done is we've passed a buck over to businesses and said, we've made a mess of this, can you please make this better for us? And because of the nature of those people, they are very slowly coming to the grips with it, but we put so many problems in place which we shouldn't have had to put in, in there in the first place. Liam, quick comment? No comment on Brexit. <laughs> 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 you're missed the news. Very, the sensible. On Brexit be, too much, be, so. very, very <laughs> sensible. Well, you're listening to Cross Question on LBC. Uh, if you want to get a question into our panel, you know what to do. Uh, 0345 6060973. You can text 84850. You can ask Alexa to send a comment to LBC, followed by your question. Uh, you're uh, listening and watching uh, Cross Question on LBC at 831. The news headlines with Daryl Jackson. The families of two students stabbed to death in Nottingham have joined thousands of people for a vigil. The father of Grace O'Malley Kumar urged students there to look after each other. The third victim has been identified as a 65 year old school caretaker. At least 78 suspected migrants have died after an overcrowded fishing boat sank off the southern Greek coast. Authorities fear many more are missing. Retired senior doctors will be able to offer virtual consultations from anywhere in England as part of NHS efforts to bring down waiting lists. It's also hoped it will reduce huge costs spent on agencies. LBC weather, any showers passing to leave a dry night, low cloud for parts of northeast England and a low of 8 degrees. This is LBC. This is LBC with Ali Mirage. Call 0345 6060 973. Text 84850. Alexa, send a comment to LBC. It's 8.34. You're listening to uh, Ali Mirage uh, and I'm with my cross-question panel uh, this evening. Uh, Wendy Morton, uh, the Conservative MP and Chief Whip. Wendy, I've got to ask you this and I'm sorry Former to ask you this. Chief Whip. <laughs> sorry. Thankfully. Former Chief Whip. Um, <laughs> I wanted to ask you this. Do you regret supporting this trust? Not at all. Good for you. At least, at least you, at least you, um, 
uh, at, le- at least you're at least you're open and honest about it. Do you do you think with hindsight anything should have been done differently? Very briefly. Look, hindsight's a great thing. Um, she moved very very quickly. She think I think she thought that was the right thing to do yep. in the context. It was a very difficult time. We just had the the passing of her maj- yeah, majesty. Yeah, sure. um, but you know she she was determined to deliver for the country. Um, so I I backed her and I you know I chose to do that and I okay. I still think that. For me, that was the right thing to do. All right, okay. Uh, Liam, uh, Liam O'Dell, um, a journalist and disability uh, rights campaigner. Very good to have you here, Liam. You've got um, your new book. You're working on a new book entitled Selling Out the Spectrum. Yes. Um, thank you for the plug. Um, it's, uh, it's it's a long way off yet, but uh, it's, it's looking at kind of trust, particularly in uh, autism research, which okay. is obviously a hot topic, mm-hmm. off the back of Wakefield continuing um, misinformation around vaccines and yes. autism, yeah. um, looking at how it's lost the trust, but more importantly, how it can win it back. And my hope is that there's some interesting conversations mm-hmm. that will appeal yeah. to everyone um, mm-hmm. around how we have better conversations with one Super. another. Super. And Emma Sinclair, the entrepreneur who's also Chief Executive of Enterprise Alumni, I was, I was very... Um, It was very good to read, actually, Emma, that at 29, you were the youngest person ever in the UK to take a company uh, public or name. It's true. And your other claim to fame is that you also entered the same school as I did. Did I? Yes, which is also Luciana Berger, who was here the other night, also did. See the old school network, and yes again, typical. Old school network, and I didn't even tell the... I'd, the love, to tell, didn't even tell I'd love to tell everybody there was a really high-end boarding school that cost a fortune, but it wasn't. No, we indeed. We can't pretend that, can <laughs> no, we? No, we can't. <laughs> and Ronnie Cohen as well from the S&P. Ronnie, great to have you. And you spent... Proper time, 35 years actually running a business. I always ask people who do that. I spent 35 years working in IT, the last 12 I I ran one business. Yeah, do you think it's important? I I ask people this when they come in. Do you think it's important for politicians to have real world experience? I think it's important that across the spectrum we have politicians who understand all sorts of aspects of life. There's lots of people with experience that I've not got who have worked in the civil service, worked in banking, worked in teaching, worked in uh, medical profession, stuff like that. So it's nice to have that mix with another person. Indeed. Well, look, one politician who has an experience that some of us don't have is Nadine Doris. It's just come in now, some breaking news for you. She just tweeted about the fact that she still hasn't resigned as an MP. Sorry, uh, Liam, you're going to have to wait to cost your vote. Um, She's obviously the MP for Mid-Bedfordshire. She says that she's requested uh, copies of WhatsApp uh, messages and text messages and all emails and minutes of uh, both the formal and informal meetings with names of senior figures unredacted regarding the rejected recommendation that she would be given a peerage uh, and is going to continue serving in Parliament until she gets all those messages sent to her. But it's absolutely her intention to resign. Now, that's really made me breathe a sigh of uh, relief. Uh, Liam? Uh, Intent is very different to actions. Um, What we're seeing is her putting her self-interest above her own constituents. Uh, I I couldn't care less if she gets a peerage or not. What I want to see is uh, a a politician that's doing their job. And she hasn't been representing with Beds well in Parliament. She hasn't spoken at all, or not not a lot at all, since uh, Mm -hmm. Boris Johnson's... Uh, to, uh, for Rory. Um, I think she's holding yeah. constituents to ransom. Let's have a by-election. Well, and for those tuning in, Liam is one of her uh, constituents, so that's why <laughs> I went to Liam. Just very, very quickly, Wendy, before we go on. Look, I think it's... <sighs> it, she, she said she's going to resign. It's down It's down to Nadine, so I'm not going to get dragged into into this. I'm going to stay focused on what I do. Ronnie? She's backtracked. She's realised she's not got a place in the House of Lords and she's pulled one out to... Which, uh, unless this is done, which she knows it's not going to get done, I'm just not going to resign. So she's hanging on. Emma, she says she's a Liverpool girl who's been stopped by posh boys getting into the House of Lords. Any sympathy? I look forward to moving on to the next subject. I've got nothing, <laughs> I, can, I, could, got nothing I can contribute on very that good. matter. Very good. Uh, ben in Clacton's got our next question. Uh, very good evening. Ben, what would you like to ask? Good evening, Ali, and good evening, panel. My question is, why has the government criminalised protest? Mm. Well, that is a very interesting question. We've been talking about that for the last hour, the first hour, in a very sparky debate. Ronnie? Yeah, that's a great question. <coughs> you know, they've also changed the rules on voting. We've now got a voter ID, which I think is going to be detrimental to people turning out and engaging in the democratic process. We've always had the right to vote. We've always had the right to protest. Uh, Yes, uh, examples throughout history where protests went over the mark and they, they were disruptive and violent and obviously nobody wants to see that. But we have got a very controlled system, particularly at Westminster, where you book where you want to protest. Where we're going to, where we're going to get together, how many of us are going to be there, where we're going to march to, how many people are going to speak and when we're all going to disperse. And yet that's not good enough, apparently. And we're not going to clamp down on people being too loud and we're not clamping down if I'm right saying people walking too slowly. 
Well, Ronnie, you have to accept that a lot of people up and down the country have been quite frustrated about some of the tactics, particularly of Just Up Oil, in recent months, uh, which is blighting people's lives. And we were talking about this earlier. What do you say to them? I've, I've protested before. I've been in marches for things that I believed in were important. Uh, and to raise a profile of it, maybe you get hundreds of thousands of people out in the street. And yes, that can be disruptive if you're stopping traffic. I absolutely get that. But uh, the fundamental question is, do people have the right to raise their voice? And these people are doing this out of frustration and disappointment and anger in the first place. So let's address the issues that they want to bring to us in the first place. Liam? Um, change doesn't happen quietly. Um, we've we've learned that from, from history. You, you, you don't kind of... Um, you don't raise these issues with please and thank yous. Um, if 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 that doesn't well, you can start with that. But if it doesn't have, if it doesn't work out, then obviously you you need to do more more kind of civil disobedience to get the, uh, someone's attention. Um, but criminalising protest, it's it, it goes back to what I said in the in the previous question about Boris, and I'm not going to drag us back down there. But um, it comes back to accountability. Why 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 is the government? Uh, I'm kind of answering that question with my own question, but why is the government not allowing for accountability and allowing for people to voice their discontent? Well, what they would argue, Liam, is that they are, but uh, they've also got to balance the rights yeah. of the protesters with the rights of people to go about their jobs and get to their businesses and take their kids. We haven't heard anything about the actual conversations that they are having with Just Stop Oil or, or having with Extinction Rebellion. There's, there seems to be no clear communication that they are at least sitting down and listening uh, that might seem as a that might seem like a concession to these Tory MPs to the Tory government but if you can't even show that you are listening and you're taking this very strong militant stance without even taking that initial step I think I'd be a bit more understanding if they took that step uh, if they took the steps they're taking when they've listened and shown that they've listened and then have a greater argument. If they're saying, right, we're going to criminalise protest mm. um, without even hearing the side out in a very kind of proper, civilised But meeting. what's the evidence, Liam, that they're not listening to the side? Because yeah. I think uh, I think a just a poor, uh, some they were asked the other day how many meetings they've had with MPs. When do, well, let me just ask you that and I'll come to Wendy. Look, I think that point about evidence is a really important one. And I think wherever there is a protest or there is opposition, you know, as backbench MPs, as, as government, you are very attuned to that noise and, to, and, we're, mm. and, and you are listening. But I think this is about a balance. And I think for me, this is there is still a right to protest and to have your voice heard. But it's only right that at the same time, you know, the, the, the British public can go about their lives. They can still get to work. You know, if we want to boost productivity, we've got to help businesses get the kids to school, get to that hospital appointment. Um, and so and so for me, for me, I think it was it was right that we needed a bit of adjustment in terms of in terms of that of that balance. But of course, there are still mechanisms and ways in which anybody can can make their voice their voice heard. But I think it was about, going a bit too yeah, far. Sorry, didn't go. Yeah, but I was just saying, if you want to talk about get, helping people get to work and other things like that, let's resolve the strikes. Like, right, right, you know, the train strikes are a massive issue that's affecting people to, to transport to, to work, transport about. And we've we heard, and I think it was a transport committee, or certainly one of the committees, that it's costing them more to fight these strikes than, than, listen, to, uh, than, than listen or even indeed pay what they're asking. So your, your point, Liam, is that there are many ways that like, people's lives are being disrupted, not just protest. Well, well, exactly. Well, that primarily, but also if we're, if we're talking about dis disruption, yep. there's... Why, why aren't we talking about strikes and, okay. and taking more action on that? Okay. May I? Yes, I please. suppose, look, you can expand any conversation to lots of other things that we're all yeah. thinking about. If I was to take it back to what you were asking, look, on the one hand, I think there's a big difference between protest and mass disruption. I attend lots of protests. Um, you know, Emmeline Pankhurst, if she hadn't run out there and mm -hmm. caused all that trouble, uh, I probably wouldn't be sitting here today, or, or probably you would be sitting here today, Wendy. Uh, on the other hand, I was walking down the Finchley Road a couple of years ago when a group of cars uh, out there were on loudspeakers were shouting about uh, uh, raping Jews. And that is not for me a protest. So I think there's a there's a line, That's and appalling. I don't think. Yes, it was widely reported and it was yeah, terrifying absolutely. and shocking. So I think there's a big difference mm. between um, protest and mass disruption with nefarious intentions. Personally speaking. I think it's a point, a point well made. Do you want to come back on this? Ah, Fine. Okay, well, you're listening to Cross Question. Uh, you know what to do. If you still want to get a question into our panel, you just call 0345 6060973. You can also text 84850 and you can ask Alexa to send a comment to LBC followed by your question. You're watching Cross Question and listening to Cross Question on LBC. It's 845.
LBC. Nick Ferrari at breakfast. The mother and her fiancé convicted of killing her nine-year-old son in the bath following a brutal punishment campaign. Paul's in Bedford. It's more of it for me to throw my old profession and colleagues under the bus, but on this occasion, I think it's worthy. That poor statement from that officer, we're not going to refer ourselves because it doesn't fall into the category. He's absolutely disgraceful. Hannah's in London. I work as a designated safeguard in leading the school. We just recently just had a case where police went out to the house. There was an incident in the house with the dad but now come Wednesday, I've not heard anything from the police. I was notified by the police that they've been out. Nick Ferrari at breakfast. Back tomorrow morning from 7. Listen on your radio and on Global Player, LBC. Ali Mirage on LBC. Call 0345 6060 973. You're listening to LBC 848. Uh, you're listening and watching the cross question. And uh, I'm joined by my uh, stellar panel, uh, Wendy Morton, the former Chief Whip Conservative uh, MP, uh, Liam um, O'Dell, the journalist and disability campaigner, uh, Emma Sinclair, the entrepreneur, and Ronnie Cohen, uh, the SNP. MP. Cowan. 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 Moo. Yeah. Cowan. Okay, great. <laughs> <laughs> I will get there in the end. Sorry, Ronnie. Uh, well, let's go to our next question from Jane in Oxford. Good evening, Jane. Hello. What would you like to ask? Um, I would like to ask that um, we're so desperate um, for our doctors, nurses, teachers, um, so many, um, you know, of our care workers in this country. Um, I just don't really understand why um, you know, uh, they're paying six, seven million pounds a day um, for immigrants coming to this country, and we actually can't pay for our doctors and nurses um, to actually stay in our country because they're, they're actually leaving us because they, they're not getting the pay. Um, so there's something desperately wrong. Okay, Jane. Uh, Liam. I was really hoping you weren't coming to me first. Um, <laughs> I, I think. Um, it's, it is it's a, it's a tricky balance. You can always pit um, ex uh, government expenditure in one area against another. I, I, I don't think, from experience and from my understanding, doing that is, is not always helpful. Um, not, well, not least in the sense of, of uh, doctors and immigrants to, um, 
to communities who get quite a fair bit of beating from uh, from the wider public, but also um, m- more importantly, politicians. Mm-hmm. I I think I think this the question speaks to a. Uh, a broader point around immigration whereby I think we need to show compassion for this. I I think I would worry that uh, I I would say that with immigration we need to have uh, the um, sorry, I'm stumbling on my own words. I really no, wish no, you didn't no. come to me first. No, 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 it's fine. We, 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 we can come back. But just oh, on yes. the asylum point, just on the yes. asylum point. So yes. I think the point that Jane's making is that we are spending between six and seven million pounds a day yes. on housing asylum seekers, obviously in hotels. And that money, uh, Jane is saying, why can't we redeploy that money to spend on NHS? And let me just give you a bit of background for, for the listeners here. Junior doctors across England have begun a 72-hour strike. Uh, demanding a 35% pay increase. They've been going on about that for quite a long time now. They say this would be a pay restoration uh, to match uh, the greater amount that inflation has gone up by since 2009. Yesterday, junior doctors in Scotland rejected the pay offer put to them by the SNP-run government. Uh, Ronnie, Hammer, Ronnie might have a view on that in a minute. And so they are also now expected to strike for three days in a month's time. Ronnie, let me come to you. Well, first of all, immigration is good for the United Kingdom. It always has been. Uh, if you look at the diaspora that we have across the world, of, 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 from yeah. Scots, we're, we're everywhere. But this is a silent but, no, yeah, related, but, right? Well, since you've being... In my constituents, I've got people from Far East, Middle East, from European countries who have come to live in my constituency and they've been accredited to themselves, their families, and they contribute to my constituency. I've also got, or not, uh, more recently, I've got guys who are being housed in a local hotel. They're not there because they want to be there. They're there because they're fleeing countries from torn apart, primarily because we were in their countries in the first place. Including Albania? <laughs> Are we going down this Albanian... Yeah, because 12,000 people came across last year and they abused the system so, and they've been returned. So they've been returned? Yeah, but that's only because uh, yeah, the Prime Minister actually made an effort to go and speak to the Albanian Prime Minister to get that returns agreement done, which is what happened. So they abused the system in the first place because they're not fleeing persecution. So the guys I'm talking about in my... my uh, uh, I don't, I don't name the hotel, uh, are from Afghanistan or from right. Syria yeah, or from course. Yemen. Uh, yes. uh, and th- th- their, their countries have been torn asunder and they've come here to seek refuge and seek asylum. The, the fact of that is the immigration system is so slow and so broken. Mm-hmm. These guys have been without seeing a home office minister for over 12 months to actually start the process. And the other side of the argument was should we be paying doctors and nurses more? Absolutely, we should be paying doctors and nurses more. And we're trying to do very hard to do that. We've lost doctors and nurses because of Brexit. A lot of but people, why are the NHS a lot of people, outcomes? A lot of people who were working yeah. in our NHS were yeah. from were immigrants here in the first place. But Ronnie, Ronnie, why are the NHS outcomes? Uh, now you've got your leader Hamza Youssef. Why are they so absolutely uh, appalling outcomes at the NHS <sighs> in Scotland? Why is it performed so badly for people? Well, okay, first and foremost, up until this moment in time, we've avoided all strikes at the NHS in Scotland because we've sat down and had mature, responsible co- uh, conversations with the trade unions and with the members. This doctor strike that's just crept up today hasn't happened yet, and hopefully that can also be avoided through some sort of a, a grown-up ag- agreement. The fact that you were saying the, the Scottish NHS is performing badly, uh, it is not. If you look at the figures that have been produced, it is be- it's performing best out of the four home nations. We've got more doctors, we've got more midwives, we've got more nurses per head of population than any other country. We've got shorter waiting lists, you know, we've got better outcomes. I don't know where you get your figures, so it's telling me differently. Well, I think a lot of people uh, would disagree with you on the outcomes, but... Well, let's, 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 let's look at the figures now. You show me the figures that tell me I'm wrong. Okay. Emma. I've got a couple of things to say quickly on this. I feel extremely strongly on this subject. Mm -hmm. First of all, my family were immigrants from Eastern Europe. I'm the first in my family to go to university. I had a Ukrainian former minister and her kids lived with me in March. I've had kids for 10 years living with me from all over the world and they contribute to society. Um, I'd really like to spend some of that money on redeploying people because there's so many skilled people Mm -hmm. amongst those people being housed in hotels and elsewhere Mm -hmm. who I'd really like to redeploy them into the workforce. Um, I Two things, I'd like to talk quickly about that and quickly about the NHS. The workforce point, um, last year when the the war broke out, I created a consortium of 200 large companies with a charity called RefuAid that Mm -hmm. focused on six months full-time English language training for skilled people Mm -hmm. so that they were able to get jobs commensurate with experience. So unlike my family, they could come here, learn English and carry on being dentists or doctors or vets or all the things we need. So I'm like, there's a lot of money being spent. I did go and see the government. I'm not certainly not looking to shame them at all, but we did that outside of the government because I I went for a meeting there and and it didn't seem like it was going to be the fastest Mm -hmm. route to solve this. So first of all, I'd like some of them 
that money go to teaching people English and getting people into jobs because that seems like a really great use of money and time. The second thing about doctors and NHS, and these are big subjects with yes. small sound bites, is this. So amongst the refuge aid family, so to speak, we've got tons and tons, hundreds, thousands of skilled people who need to, for example, to be a doctor, you have to retrain here, you have to retrain in yes. the NHS, you have to learn. I know a couple of hundred doctors who have been working for 15 to 20 years plus, who have reputable degrees, who speak fluent English, who either can't get a job in the NHS because of some ridiculous bureaucracy I'd be delighted another time to mm -hmm. go into. Or, for example, there were some who were given special dispensation to work during COVID, um, special certification, mm -hmm. but were paid a third of the price uh, so long as a doctor sponsored them. So there are lots of things that are wrong and it's not only it's not that people are coming here necessarily, as hard as that is. OK, Wendy. Yeah, I think what Emma has done is highlighted the complexity of this situation. It is complex, I think yeah. we do have an issue with um, immigration. Nobody likes to be having to spend this huge amount of money on um, asylum hotels, um, but we have to we have to unpick some of this, which is why the Prime Minister has his small boats policy. That that is one part of this. Mm -hmm. I think in terms of skills, um, we had an issue in the agricultural and the farming sector. The mm -hmm. government has, mo has moved some way in 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 helping in helping there. But I think for, you know, and the I think what we also have to do is look at what the drivers of migration or immigration or asylum are and recognise really what these are. I do think that the Home Office does need to speed up what, yes, it, what it's yeah. doing. But the um, Albania example, I think, is a really good example where the, the government has gone back to source, as it were, to Albania mm. to see how we can how we can work together. Because there are some countries that do not want to see yeah. young people moving because they suffer from the brain drain, is, is one way of explaining it. Indeed. Let me go to our next question, which is a text question from Alice in Camden. The government prevented on-site drug <clears throat> testing uh, from uh, f uh, from being done at a music festival over the weekend. Isn't this attitude towards drugs likely to mean young people die? Now, let me give you some context here in case you missed this story. Uh, this was the first time since 2014 that on-site testing of confiscated pills could not take place at the Park Life Festival in Manchester uh, with the Home Office uh, telling organisers they would need to apply for a special licence uh, to do this. Emma. I mean, I <clears throat> had missed that story. Yes. Um, essentially, but generally on the point about drug testing and in this particular case, uh, to try and, you know, root out the issue because clearly people there perhaps were taking... Well, drugs. I mean, my, off, off the back of things, my, my practical comment would be you're not necessarily going to find the people, there are drugs everywhere. You can slip them and do them at the office, do them at mm. music festivals. Yeah. Yeah. I, yeah. I, I don't think that, for example, that is yeah. reason to tell the government they're not caring about young people. That's Ronnie, you're itching to get in. I'm in the... APPG for drug policy of reform. Course. Mm. Of course. Um, Loop would probably be the organisation who are running this. Uh, and what Loop do is they set up at music festivals, at concerts, or all night, if you're still calling them raves, whatever they're called, and they give people the option of testing the drugs they've just bought. Mm -hmm. And what they're doing is they're saving lives. And they're saving lives because a lot of kids have been given a bag of something. Here, take yeah. one of these pills, whether it be yellow, blue, purple, whatever the, the trend is this week. And they do not know what's in that one pill. I can tell a story of a young girl. Uh, I won't need her name, but uh, she was a 15-year-old girl, bright, lively, vivacious, very much loved, who took one tab at one, one morning and it killed her within hours. Now, had she had the facility to test that, she would not have taken it because it was the contents of it would have been quite obvious to her. Yeah. And what the reason we have to do this is because the drugs are illegal in the first place and we've handed over the control of them Okay. to the criminal fraternity who will produce these things in a garage somewhere yeah. and hand them out willingly. If we legalised the drug and then legislated the living daylights out of it, we could control the content. The same was done with alcohol. You don't walk into a pub and say, give me some alcohol, not knowing what's in it. And it's, it's, it's a very big topic to unpick here, but it's very, very pithy, because I'm going to get one more in quickly. C completely Liam. agreed. Um, the war on drugs has failed. We're, um, pe young people are scared to open up about this. When we create an environment of hostility, people aren't going to be open about the drugs that they take. They will lose their lives. If you allow them to test the drugs themselves, it's a much safer thing. And if we legalise it and open it up and see it as a mental health issue, yes. then, then it's a much more... Wendy? Much I just think, you know, this this should be all about keeping young people safe. I'm not against testing at all, but it's about keeping keep making sure that people are, are safe. I'm not in the same space as Ronnie when it comes to de uh, decriminalising uh, every, every, everything. But, I mean, you know, nobody wants to see a young person go to a, a rave or a festival... Uh, 
and, and lose their lives. Yeah. Now, can I just say, as a per- personally as a DJ who's uh, DJed all around the world in many clubs and different venues, I don't think you need to have drugs at all to have a good time. So I just think we should try and get away from drugs, but that's just my Actually, own... Actually, they need you as a DJ. Personal, personal, personal thing. <laughs> uh, well music, music, music is more than enough. Right, the fun question. This is the most fun part of the entire hour. <laughs> from Jenny in Malvern. Staff at an Indian restaurant in Birmingham got a bit of a shock last night when singer Pink popped in for dinner just before her concert at Aston Villa's football stadium. Have you spotted a celebrity in an unexpected place? Ronnie? An unexpected place? I don't, I don't look too sure. because I, I bumped into and I'd have my photograph taken on a very nice chat with Keanu Reeves, but he was in Port oh. House visiting Westminster. <laughs> is that an unexpected place? <laughs> That's fantastic. I got to be the one of Reverend Jesse Jackson, who uh, oh. was a hero of mine, so that was a great privilege to bump it in. But those were both of in Westminster. What I find is the London Underground is a great place to spend and <laughs> think, is that a famous person? <laughs> is that who I think it is? <laughs> but the team they've got for, I've got for, yeah. forgotten who they were. Emma? Um, well, my celebrities are honestly people that have started large businesses, so I get quite excited yeah. if I'm in the airport and I spot business people. Um, but I spend a lot of time in Los Angeles for my business. I've seen hundreds of people that would be considered celebrities. I suppose one of my favourites is being in a Chinese restaurant in Beverly Hills, sitting next to Stevie Wonder. Oh, I said, oh, these are the best noodles in the world I've ever had. And he started singing, I just called to say I love you to the noodles. Very yeah, quickly. Oh, yeah. one, 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 yeah. <laughs> one of the benefits of being autistic is that I'm very good at recognising faces. Um, and I'm fairly and that I recognised Louis Farouk just as he was leaving a Starbucks coffee once and I would have loved to have a chat with him. Excellent. Wendy? I clearly don't go to the right places. <laughs> <laughs> once upon a time, before I got involved in politics, I might have spotted a politician and thought, wow, that's so-and-so. But I think things have moved on. Well, thank you very much, indeed. What a fantastic panel uh, to uh, Wendy Morton, uh, Liam O'Dell, uh, Ronnie Cohen. Cowan. 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 <laughs> and Emma Sinclair. I will get it right at some point. (laughs) Thought block. Thank you very much. Fantastic panel. And I'm late to the news, so I'm in big trouble. Uh, But coming up next. The NHS is to open 10 more specialist clinics for severely obese children in the face of soaring numbers of under 18 suffering weight-related health problems. These centres uh, are going to be announced at the Health Service Conference and they're going to bring the total number of such institutions to 30, double the number originally planned. Hospital admissions of obese children have nearly tripled in a decade, rising from 3,370 to 9,431. This is an issue that has been going on for a long time now. Obesity is a huge problem for the NHS. All